A farmer's love goes beyond the soil. In this conversation with Walter Mora and Susan Davis, who are partners in life, husband and wife who've been together and found each other 20 years ago, we dive deep into the connection that we have with energy, with divine guidance, with building not just nutrient rich soil, but living soil and the power of listening to our intuition as farmers and as stewards of the earth and deeply sinking into our roots and our purpose and why we're here and how we're here to serve individually and collectively. I'm really excited to share this conversation with you. I'm Natalie Forsbauer, founder and editor-in-chief of Heart and Soil Magazine. Be sure to hit that subscribe button and like this video, share it with your friends far and away to help amplify and spread the regeneration conversation for planetary health and global regeneration. And if you haven't subscribed to Heart and Soul Magazine yet, hop on over to heartandsoulmagazine.com where you can grab your subscription and get access to all the back issues as well. It's a really great opportunity to join an amazing community of farmers and gardeners and people who like to eat really good food. Enjoy the conversation and make yourself an amazing day. Walter, how um, I understood, I understand you became interested in farming at a pretty young age. You're still in high school. And I'm wondering what was it about farming that was attractive? Well, actually, there, there were two things. You know, I grew up mainly in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And um, I was going through a crisis in high school where I felt my friends could not be trusted. And the less I would ever have to do with humanity, the better. <laughs> and uh, at the same time, my, my sister just married a sheep farmer, uh, 7,000 sheep and beef animals and stuff. And my vacations, I would go up there and help. And I really enjoyed the work. And also um, nature was very healing for me. So I decided farming would be just the right thing for me. Not only did I enjoy it, but I really wouldn't have to deal with people too much. But um, I did end up uh, three years later going to a very intensive community. Um, and no, I left New Zealand. Um, I should go back a little bit. I had to work on I was going to do a degree in farm management. And for that, I had to work on farms for two years. And I was uh, working on conventional farms. And I, I already realized that I was um, fighting nature. We were fighting nature instead of working with her. And I uh, read Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, which had just come out at that time. It was a very important book, you know, raised awareness about the problems of modern agriculture. And also, um, I, I already knew about Rudolf Steiner and biodynamic farming. And uh, uh, I, I had a little accident. I couldn't work for two, year, for two months. And uh, in that time, I visited some biodynamic farms. My parents suggested I go and visit some. And, and uh, I did. And this one farmer, he just impressed me, uh, his, his being, he was getting ready to, to retire and just the way he related to the land and everything, just thought, well, if this is what a lifetime of biodynamic farming does to a, a person, I'm going to become a biodynamic farmer. So I left New Zealand to um, go and work on some biodynamic farms uh, in Europe. Yeah. Wow. What was it about him that you were drawn to? Well, you know, farmers sometimes can get a little hardened and, and uh, you know, just getting on with the work. And I spent the day with him. It was just a small farm, about 15 acres. But it was very, it was a like an ideal biodynamic farm uh, where it was very diversified. He milked a couple of cows. He had a vegetable garden, an orchard and chickens and stuff. And he had raised his family. Being able to do that, I don't know if you still could do it. At times were more simple then. And uh, we were back walking back towards the house across the pasture and a hawk flew overhead and he made me stop. And he, I can't remember what he said, but anyway, he admired the hawk, right? And I thought, well, if you still have time to 
to admire the uh, a hawk, you know, after working so hard your whole life, then that's that's what I wanted to be. Yeah. Wow. That so was actually the still um, admiring the beauty of, of nature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's really cool. And then, so then you went into studying biodynamic farming and, uh, and where did you do that? Um, I, the first place I went to was a, a Campbell community outside Belfast, Northern Ireland. My, my older brother happened to be there and, and, uh, they had a, a, you know, a small farm attached to it. Mm -hmm. Campbell communities usually, um, work with handicapped adults mm -hmm. and children. Uh, this was a community of about 200 people and I was mainly working on the farm there. So we were milking about 12 cows and making hay and stuff. I was uh, just turned 21 when I was there. And that's where, where I met my uh, late wife. She she was from Long Island, you know, New York, mm -hmm. United States. And uh, she went back to get a Waldorf teacher's uh, degree and... Uh, I followed her. That's how I ended up being in, in the United States for about 35 years. That's <coughs> most of my adult life was there. Uh, okay. First of all, in communities, and then I uh, bought my own farm. Okay. That's really cool. We actually just featured Camp Hill, Camp Hill's communities in the last uh -huh. issue of Birds Hill Magazine. So that's really uh -huh. cool. That that's where your roots are as well. So I'm curious, Walter, what is it about biodynamics that you feel deeply connected with? I think, you know, in high school, well, my parents, my mother knew about anthroposophy and even in high school, I read uh, uh, Knowledge of Higher Worlds. And um, so I had a little background in it and I think I, I was just, um, attracted to the, the spiritual aspect that we can, as human beings, we can now, again, I'm sure we used to do it way back in the past, but anyway, we can work with the spiritual formative forces of the universe. We can open the soil up with the biodynamic pra uh, preparations and, and some of the other practices uh, so that the um, cosmic influences can be active within the earth again because because of all the pollution and and of course conventional farming we deaden the soil the soil becomes so dead that it's hard for those influences to come down and now of course with uh with the internet and stuff and especially i'm, I'm sure it'll be even worse with uh 5g you know we're putting up the 20 to 50,000 satellites or something and just creating this huge web around the earth and, and it's we we now have to do do things to make it so that um the plants can still take up those those spiritual forces because it you know um in our little community here in ecuador uh, you know, we, we often say, we always say grace before the meal, and, and one of them is, uh, the bread is not our food, what feeds us in the bread is God's eternal word, his spirit and his life. So it's not so much the mineral substance that we eat, it's more the um, spiritual forces within the life force of the food. Yeah. And uh, I think with biodynamic farming, we can, we can, uh, enhance those life forces again and actually i i always had even from my 20s when i was in my 20s had three sort of uh, parts to my life one was to grow good healthy biodynamic food one the other one was to honor the earth in the best way possible which is two slightly different things and the other one was to help non-farmers reconnect to the earth and I have to admit that part was more done by uh, my late wife and, and now Susan. Um, you know, farmers tend to be a little, maybe not quite so 
communicative as, as, as say, a teacher. I mean, there's a reason why we do different things, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, um, uh, Joan, my late wife, was able, would bring her class or sometimes even the whole school community to do festivals and stuff on the land. Wow. Yeah. That's really yeah. powerful. Tell me, how does biodynamic steward the earth? Well, the, the four main parts to biodynamics. One is, you know, we create a, a, a ecosystem, mm -hmm. and and really one one has to uh, think of energies. You know, in the spiritual world, it's all about energy. So uh, there are different ways to describe biodynamics, but if if one believes that the physical world is a reflection of the spiritual, then you know, how, how does the spiritual idea incarnate into the earth, mm -hmm. into physical matter? And as a biodynamic farmer, we're, we're totally in, involved with that, letting the idea, the, the beings, you know, spiritual beings incarnate as physical, as physical matter. So from that point of view, we, we steward the earth. Um, and of course, we we have the um, the preparations, mm -hmm. which are so important in, in creating the the being of the farm. And we also try to we also work with a planning calendar that's based on the uh, moon going through the zodiac. So the elements: earth, water, air, and fire. And also, I think my favorite part is we try to work with the elemental beings, the unseen beings, the nature spirits. I, I, I think that's so exciting that even if we don't consciously, can't consciously see them, we can, um, you know, we can honor them and, and know that they're there. And uh, yeah, that, that's important to me. Yeah, tell me more about that. Can, can I just read uh, read now what I sent uh, read yeah. to you before? But yeah. okay, the main uh, leader of the the interns here, uh, I asked him uh, about this so that I could share it with you, and he just captured it this way. Why I think it's important that Finca Sagrada is a biodynamic farm. It creates awareness of the beings in the higher realms that connect us to the divine. This generates a, a um, Taurus with our thoughts and actions, such as meditation, flowing upwards through the higher realms to the divine, then flowing outwards like a fountain back down to Mother Earth and cycling back up through the plants and food that we eat. And I was dumbstruck. I've never heard of biodynamics caught so perfectly spiritually and actually. And that's what this farm is about. And that's because of Walter's devoting his whole life to this. Mm, that's really powerful, Susan. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. That really encapsulates it quite poignantly and poetically. So how does that all relate to building nutrient-rich or nutrient-dense soil? Yeah, and biodynamics, I, I mean, the nutrient rich is, uh, you know, important. But I think we often in biodynamics talk more about the, the spiritual forces or energy, the life force. Mm -hmm. And that for me, that's very much what, it, what it's about. So mm -hmm. because we use those uh, four things that I just mentioned, mm -hmm. um, I think the we can create a, a living soil that actually wants to become plant. Mm. It, it's so so close to be living. You know, if you take a handful of good forest soil or, or really rich garden soil, you know, it smells good, it, it feels mm. good, and you just feel like it wants to become um, plant-like living. And so when we put a seed into that, um, all those energies uh, can can like rush into the seed as it as it germinates and 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 just imbue the whole plant with with that uh, 
that life force. Mm -hmm. I love how you reframed nutrient rich or nutrient dense soil to the living soil, because ultimately that's what we want, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, that's really powerful. So you have a biogenetic, you've been a biodynamic farmer for a very, very long time. Forever. And you forever, <laughs> we'll just say forever. I'm, I'm 72 and I started when I was 18, so that make 54 years. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. That's My math so is good. cool. That's really cool. So, and from what I understand is you've actually um, practiced on four different continents, right? Yeah, I started and, in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm wondering is, is how does biodynamic farming change from continent to continent? Can you do the same things on each continent or is there, what, what does a person have to keep in mind or what's fluid about the practices of biodynamics around the world and on different land? I think, well, the main thing would be the biodynamic preparations, right? Mm -hmm. And they, they were, well, they, they stem from, you know, northern, central Euro European sources. Mm -hmm. And like in Ecuador, we don't have oak trees yeah. or um, we're a little warm, too warm for uh, dandelion flowers. Yeah. So if we were spiritual seers, you know, we could say, well, instead of an oak tree, you know, for, for the tropics, we're nearly on the equator, uh, we should use such and such a tree, but we're not spiritual seers. Although I've heard, I think there are some places that are real, like in Costa Rica, are really experimenting with al alternative mm -hmm. um, plants. Um, but still, I think the preparations work all, all over the earth. So mm -hmm. I think they're still valid, um, say, on the tropics or in Africa or New Zealand, whatever. Yeah. Um, so let's and, love, so go ahead. And to me, you know, here obviously things aren't, um, aren't controlled by by the hot and cold, you know, like they would in the north or south. Here's we have a dry season and a rainy season. Mm -hmm. So I I feel like at the beginning of the rainy season is there are like spring forces on on the earth, within the earth, yeah. yeah. So I think we can modify it and, and use our own experiences, mm -hmm. imaginations, experiences to, to modify to, to the location. Oh, that's yeah. really, yeah, that's really cool. I love that you brought up the oak tree um, because that's often something that people ask about, you know, how do you make a biodynamic prep if you don't have the oak tree, you, there's no, so have you chosen a tree that's um, local and indigenous to your area that you make that prepara make preparations with, or do you bring in preparations? I, I do, I, I get them from Josephine Porter Institute. When we first came down here, um, you know, we can make the, the 500, the, the manure, horn yeah. manure and, and the, the silica preparation quite easily. Mm -hmm. um, the others I, well, we grow stinging nettle and stuff. You know, if I was uh, 40 years old, it would be a whole lot different. But yeah. um, um, so some things, you know, I do, it, do it the easy way. Like I, I buy in the preparations from yeah. Josephine Porter Institute. Although, and the other problem for me is I, my Spanish is not the greatest. Um, okay. So it's hard to like go to a, an abattoir, you know, a butchering yeah. place and ask for horns and they yeah. look at you like you're crazy and it's hard to, you've got to sort of smile and get your phone out for the translator and stuff. Yeah, that's yeah. funny. Um, I have, you know, I have the same challenges here. I'm in Saskatchewan and uh, most people put the um, the cream on the, on the cows so they don't grow horns. So their horns are hard, hard to come by to begin with. And they're, we're not, they're, the avatars aren't even allowed to give horns away or keep the horns um, from the animals. So it's a very curious, um, it's kind of difficult to find horns sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, people actually do think you're kind of different. Um, so what about, um, 
what about non-farmers? You, you said that you like to connect non-farmers with stewarding the land. And so how, how, did, how, did, how does that happen? How do you go about doing that? And I guess that's probably a question for both of you. You start. Um, yeah, usually when, when people think about connecting to nature, they, they talk about, you know, a little park down the road or you go to the national parks, you know, you, you find a beautiful uh, place in nature that's quiet and, uh, you, you know, for meditation and all that stuff. But where humans most impinge on the land is, is through farming. Mm. And of course, you know, in the States, think of the Midwest. I mean, it's dangerous to go on land because you don't know if they've just sprayed it or whatever. Um, right. Yeah, so people are very excited. What I've experienced is people are excited when they see a farmer who's, who's honoring the land and where they're invited. You know, you can go for walks and and see see the food being grown you know that, that you're going to eat or um so just by uh welcoming people onto the farm that i think that's important to see that we can you know farming is basically a little exploitive you know you're always making decisions uh, mm -hmm. say you're milking cows you know how much soybean do you feed them to get better milk production and stuff it's not always in the best interest of the animals i mean we mm -hmm. all try to um, do it in a good way but sometimes you do have to make financial decisions and um but i think the earth is is very you know mother earth is is very uh, uh forgiving of humans if we have the right the right intention, you know, um, and so I th um, so when for two examples I could give in Wisconsin where I milked 120 cows biodynamically, I, you know, it's a farm practice is when the calf is born, you take it away from the mother, so sometimes right at birth, mm -hmm. and and so the cows would never given the chance to um, to develop their mothering instincts. And sometimes the cows are a little hormonal, you know, when a calf was, I had a, a loafing shed. So, you know, the, all the other cows would be around, the cow, cow would have a calf and the cows would all come around and watch it and be a pain, in the, you know. Mm -hmm. It wasn't so peaceful because they, they wanted to see the calf and everything. And I started leaving the calf with the mother for six six weeks. And after a few months, I realized, I noticed that when a cow would have a calf, the other cows would just be quite cool about it. You know, oh yeah, just another calf. And, 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 the, and the whole herd changed. And it was the same with the bull. I, I always used a bull. And uh, the herd sort of calm down when there was a bull or two running around with them. So, you know, we can do things like that. Um, so, uh, yeah. So in answer to your question, I think people, non-farmers uh, li like to see farms where, where we honor, you know, nature in a good way and um, notice how we can grow food in harmony with nature. And I can tell a lot there because I've uh, spent my life creating networks called the uh, Kins Innovation Networks where we uh, manifest our life missions. We help each other manifest our life missions. So the best thing for me was to bring my uh, people in my networks to the farm because Walter has described how nurturing it is and people just were blown away and learned so much just from uh, hearing how he does uh, farming. So it's been a joy for me to be part of that world. Mm -hmm. Susan, what did they learn? Like how, what did, what was the connection? Well, the people who've been in my networks are all people who put a lot of time and effort into figuring out why they were alive. What am I supposed to be doing here? You have to figure it out. There's no one that tells you that. So they're very uh, conscious people. Yeah. And, and they, so I, I would find them and I would give them to each other without charge. 
and they'd start these networks that have uh, created all kinds of innovations uh, all over the world. So that's what my life has been like, but it's been anchored in what Walter has manifested, which is so powerful. Walking, uh, coming into his farm is like going to heaven, basically. Wow. <laughs> and there's no charge. It's just like, hey, come live the way we live because we are happy and healthy. So, um, yeah, that's been my life. And uh, oh, what? I was going to say, tell me more about that. Sorry, my internet, just let's pause for a second. Let's just pause for a second because the internet. Maybe it, the connection is unstable. Maybe it just wants us to deepen into this moment a bit more. Um, I was going to say, tell me more about that. Tell me more about that magical heaven-like energy. The whole idea that we're here in competition with each other is fraudulent from the beginning. You know, why would you destroy the earth that supports you? So how far away, how far wrong could humans have come all these years? And so there are lots of humans that have woken up to it and they have, uh, there's, there's zillions of people in these networks, uh, not just that I've started, but many people are starting now where you connect with others because you figured out why you're alive, what you're here to manifest. And then you help each other like crazy instead of trying to compete for bullshit, you know, or Build, build yourself up. All that stuff is just unhealthy and doesn't work anyway. So um, the movement is spreading globally very fast. And you'll find many people have taken a path like I've taken where they found uh, hopefully the right man that's uh, you know on his path. And then they can be on their path with helping each other uh, restore earth. It's about restoring earth. So I have thousands of people all over the world that have done this and are working with uh, biodynamic uh, uh, initiatives. Yeah. Wow. So tell and me, go ahead, Walter. Here, here we're, well, I should say, while I was still in the States, I did a two year course on geomancy with Marco Pokashnik. It wasn't full time, you know, we, we met, I think it was five weekends, long weekends a year. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was a little aware of the spiritual landscape that stands behind the physical. And then we came down here to Ecuador and I was helping a, a woman uh, who had some land here. She wanted to learn about biodynamics and then the neighboring land came up for sale. And uh, I wasn't looking to, to buy another farm, but it just so happened that everything fell in place and we ended up buying this land here and i knew it always felt good but i wasn't specific i didn't know specifically why and then um we were working with jyoti ma who who uh started the um 13 indigenous grandmothers and then later on another group called the fountain that had to do with finance which was really susan's connection Mm -hmm. And uh, this particular group, the fountain had four indigenous seats and four non-indigenous. And uh, one of the indigenous seats was held by the Kogi from the northern part of Colombia, who, and they've retained their spiritual uh, insights, their spiritual ways. And um, anyway, they asked if they could have the their annual our annual meeting here and we had just finished this uh, community house so we said sure but before the kogi do anything they do divination and uh, they looked at our land and said well yeah we'll come but we'll only if we can come four times because it's an ancient spiritual you know si sacred site that has to be reactivated wow. so isn't um, that incredible that's yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay. just have someone tell you that about your farm yes yes <laughs> yes i love that stuff yeah so they did come well they've been here five times now but the third time they asked us if we they invited us to to build a, a spirit house or house of original thought based on their their spiritual houses you know, with mm -hmm. the 12 posts and one of those steep thatched roofs mm -hmm. and uh I was reluctant at first because I thought, well, what are we going to do with this structure? You know, one day the cows are going to get in and, and ruin <laughs> it and all that stuff. But they came down to baptize it. That's the Kogi came down 
And they lit a fire in the middle of the spirit house and said, hey, this fire is never allowed to go out. Somehow I missed that aspect. <laughs> so that was like four years ago, we've kept the fire going. And it's the fire that really um, keeps keeps uh, the spirit house alive within our center because we have to go up there three or four times a day to, to tend the fire. And we have a lot of volunteers. If we have volunteers, they often take that on. Like mm -hmm. we have a young volunteer who's really into it. He gets up at four or five in the morning to make sure the fire's okay in wow. his, his life. And, uh, you know, the, the Kogi say, well, I'm sure other indigenous groups too, that when we have a sacred fire, it's, it's like a, uh, we're pre preparing food in the kitchen for the unseen beings, for the elemental beings. We're, we're feeding them by uh, uh, keep tending a ceremonial fire. So Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Super awesome. And wow. it's a wonderful way for us to start the day too. Luckily, we're on the equator, so the sun doesn't change much, right? It's always a little after six or before six. So it's not... You know, like if we were in Wisconsin or something, we'd have to get up at 4.30. So it's not like that for us. So it's, it's a very nice thing. And we actually do Agni Otra ceremony, uh, sunrise ceremony, you know, that's based on the ancient Vedic um, ceremonies. And yeah, so um, I think that helps with, with the, the landscape here too. Yeah, it sounds like that. And what's that like for you to um, to bridge and bring together those and honor the your spiritual journey with uh, the biodynamics and also the spiritual journey with the the ancestral ancestral presence that's part of your farm. Well, I think part of the farm is you know that prophecy of the when the eagle and the condo fly together mm -hmm. and there'll be peace. So I feel this farm here is very much about that, bringing, mm -hmm. bringing the, you know, the intellectual, um, more uh, Northern way of being, which, you know, is we tend to think of it as very destructive. It is, but it also has good aspects that, you know, like the cathedral, you know, like the Gothic cathedrals that, that were built or the beautiful classical music and stuff. They're, they're very beautiful aspects to that ego way of being, but we've lost those heart forces of, of the condor. So um, hmm. uh, we can be an be in, be example of the, of the, of the intellectual uh, being imbued with the heart forces, so like the um, the heart becoming the, the thinking member of our being. Man, um, powerful! I yeah. love. How, I just I love how you <laughs> brought those together. I man, I I hope um, everyone can feel the power of that that connecting connecting all the pieces, the two pieces which integrates many pieces right it's yeah really yeah powerful yeah it's like when the image that comes to mind it's um you know those wood puzzles that are can be really difficult to put together and then all of a sudden you just put a one or two pieces together and the other two pieces just go whoop <laughs> like they slide right in right that's yeah the that came to mind when you're talking about connecting the two so i'm wondering what you have to say to people who are living in the city who um you know, there's just not the opportunity to connect with farmers well, and farming. You can, you can adopt a farm. I did that when I was living in the city. I adopted a farm and I'd go out whenever I wanted and I helped in all kinds of ways and they were happy and I was happy. You can adopt a farm. Oh, the I farmer will never say no if you're, you know, properly intentioned, you know. Yeah. So how do you adopt a farm then, Susan? Well, I uh, had a, a young friend. And she happened to come from a farm and I would just see her at church. And then uh, it sounded like her farm was great. My mom agreed to drive me out there and 
Uh, so I started doing all the farming she did. So it's not hard to adopt a farm. It's not hard. The far, everyone, every farm needs help. They will not say no. That is so true, Susan. That is so true. And I love that you said that. So you were really young. And then did you just volunteer then when you adopted the farm? Yeah. Yeah. I grew up on a farm and um, we had people that oh. adopted the farm too. Yeah. And it was really powerful, especially when they really adopted the farm, like what you're talking about. Like you actually treat it like a job in the sense that you show up regularly and also, but there is not like a job where you necessarily are getting paid. There's just so much reciprocal um, learning and exchange. And um, it, it was, it was super powerful for us because of the help that we got. And we, we got to learn from the people who came in a, what you framed as adopting the farm. And, um, and it was powerful for them because they got to get food to fill their fridges. And they also got to have their experience of being on the farm. So I love that idea of adopting a farm. Well, and I, my, I brought my friend to the city where I lived and she got the city and I got the country. So everyone was yeah. happy. Parents were happy. Everybody was happy. Oh, yeah. that means. Well, you know, there are CSAs and stuff. Yeah. Um, where some are more active in inviting their customers out um, than others. But uh, yeah, I, uh, personally, I, I think it's going to be very difficult in the next few years for, you know, if there are food shortages and stuff. To... Yeah, how can, how can we prepare for that, Walter? Start helping a farm. Well, I'm I'm a little radical. <laughs> tell tell me more about that radicalness. Well, I don't think I don't know if we have to go there, but I I think there could be quite a bit of um, social chaos and stuff, especially if there's okay. no food around. And uh, right. so I, I, I don't. So people, I, you know, if you live in a city like Chicago, say you know if if, if the truck stop stop running for five days, you know, there'll be no food. Yeah. And within 10 days you'd have to start walking. And as February, you're tough. <laughs> right. I yeah. So let's reframe that question. So what can we do today to uh have what can we do though? You know, and maybe it's not to prepare for that. What can we do? Uh well, connecting with having a farm person connect with a city person, there's lots of protection and joy in that. Mm -hmm. Duh. Mm -hmm. It's right there as an idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, you know, we're, we're expanding, just getting off that topic a little bit, but what we're doing here in in uh Vilka, just outside Vilcabamba where our farm is um we're we're um buying some more hectares acres next door and we're trying to uh, expand our community because you know susan's 80 i'm 72 and we don't need all this land for ourselves so we would like to share it with more people and also all our volunteers I, most of them have um, are traveling, you know, in, in South America, they, they're trying to step off the matrix, trying to find new ways to be. I think that's the big question. How do we create a supportive community for ourselves? And um, whether you do that within a city and, and see um, how, how to make connection with a particular farm or you know area and outside the city and on, on the land or if you actually um move into the the country um mm -hmm. that um to really uh try to reconnect to the land we we have a, a mission statement for our landers um we are uh, uh, creating a biodynamic farm community that helps people reconnect to self, to community, and the earth. Mm. Um, 
yeah, and we need more people to help us um, do that. Uh, younger energy, uh, we're more like the elders here. Um, we've been very blessed and that we can do this and, and uh, both of us have, you know, over the years built up a lot of skills like on one farm made yogurt, another farm made cheese, and another time I, I had a small bakery and I've grown vegetables and I've milked cows. So I have a very wide range of um, skills yeah. related to the land. And Susan has more the, you know, people skills, helping people to, to reconnect to each other. So we're, we're, um, we met uh, 20 years ago. So um, we're still going strong. Pretty yeah, blessed. That that. Way. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I noticed, um, one of the things I noticed, Susan, is the incredible space you hold for each other, Walter for Susan and Susan, you for Walter. And uh, I'm just wondering if you can share what that's like to hold that space and to honor each other, because it feels like it uh, is very, it's a poetic part of your partnership and of your relationship oh he took on quite a bit till we met 20 years ago he he took on lots of challenges and met them all and survived it and same with me we both had very unusual challenges because at a young age we trusted our our own intuition that we should do what, what it was telling us to do and uh in both of our lives virtually everyone we knew told us we were crazy <laughs> And we just stuck with it. We were like, well, if I can't trust myself, who can I trust? Mm -hmm. So he went ahead with his inner vision and I went ahead with mine. And then when we met, I was in high finance. I was transforming finance from greed and fear to love and joy. And I, I succeeded in starting an industry called the social investment industry. So imagine how tough that was. And he was taking on something just as tough. And so when we met, we were like, oh my God, you mean I can stop being at war with the other side and I can just, you know, share all my love with you and you can share all your love with me. And that worked out pretty well for the last 20 years and we deserved it, I have to say. So uh, if there's one message I can give to people, it's like, trust your intuition. You know, you were born for a certain reason and none of us know when we're born what it is and they wipe our memory. So we can't even go find out. And you have to, uh, the only way you can find it is to trust your intuition. And then you, you're happy all the time, no matter what challenges happen, it doesn't matter because when you're on your path, you're so at one with your heart and your soul. It's all that you need. Yeah. And so you find another person that was at the same place with his heart and soul as I was. That was like unbelievable. He had me from hello. <laughs> he had me from hello. Oh, that's really cool. Tell us more about how we can tap into that inner wisdom and that intuition. What does that feel like and look like? And how does one do that? Your turn. Um, for me, um, you know, my as a farmer, my my spiritual path has been very much through the will. You know, when you have to get up at four thirty every morning, and even on, you know, like Thanksgiving Day when everybody's starting to have their their big Thanksgiving meal at two o'clock. You know, four o'clock or three thirty, you have to start milking the cows. You know, and you know there are a lot of sacrifices you have to make, or I always uh, farmed in cold climates, upstate New York and Wisconsin. And I remember, you know, at nine or 10 o'clock, I would push the hay in and, and uh, for the cows. And uh, then I'd see if a cow was going to calve. Sometimes I'd have to set the alarm clock for two o'clock in the morning. It might be February when it's, you know, minus 20 degrees and you put on your coveralls and walk down to the barn and and pull a calf out, and then you then you have to get up again at four thirty. Um, uh, you know, so that's very much, 
your training, you know, that that's a particular spiritual training. But also farming has its very uh, beautiful aspects, like I used to plant 40 acres of corn and, and uh, you know, you work so hard, the spring is so short. And, you know, you're out there till 10 o'clock night planting the last corn before it starts raining or whatever. And uh, then you come out 10 days later to see if the corn's coming out, and, you know, and see these big long rows of corn, you know, so every spring it's a miracle. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, part of the spiritual path is, is, is reverence. So, and humility, farming teaches you humility and, and reverence. It teaches the many lessons in, in this particular path. And uh, yeah, I think tolerance is a big part of that too. You know, as, as you get older, some of the, uh, you know, your elbows get a little rounded out, <laughs> you know, and I think, uh, <laughs> That's part of relationship is, yeah. 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 Being willing to put, put the work in, yeah. Yeah. And so how does that connect you to your intuition? Um, gosh. Well, maybe a different question is, or how... Um, Okay, Susan will answer that. Yeah, because uh, my challenge was uh, I, I knew that my life mission by the time I was 30, I knew that the reason I was alive was to transform finance from fear and greed to love and joy. Mm -hmm. And it was all greed and fear. And we were destroying earth because that's what finance was about. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, this is worth my whole life. So I stopped everything and I did that. And uh, it was amazing because uh, I was happy all the time because I was on my path and I was doing really, it took, imagine the drama and innovation it took to figure out how to transform finance from greed and fear to love and joy. Just think about how you would figure out anything about that one, right? And so I was in 100% uh, creativity all the time. And I was making so many friends because other people felt that way and wanted to do something but they hadn't quite the verve that I have because I was really all in fully committed and so I started getting more and more people to come to me to want to be part of it because they hadn't had the strength themselves and so we quickly became a, a wonderful group of people in love with each other and feeling like oh finally now I'm doing what I'm supposed to do and our movement grew it became a global industry very fast because the destruction on earth had been so devastating that uh, people couldn't wait to get out of that framework. And uh, so I've been uh, gifted with the most wonderful people in the world for the last 40 years. Uh, and we've created this wonderful industry that's really getting there to uh, stop the horrors that have been going on all these years. So when you are happy doing what you know you're supposed to be doing, you're healthy all the time. Well, what's what's important? What's more important than health? Not much. <laughs> <laughs> Not much. Then, look, at, look at the husbands you can find. You know, I mean, this is all worth. It's all worth following your life path. Believe me, there's nothing wrong with following your life path. If your mother tells you not to do it, your mother's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's powerful. So what I'm hearing is listen to that inner guidance and um, do what makes you happy and do what feels purposeful. It's very creative. It's very fun. And also be creative. Yeah. So how do you, how are you creative in that season? In uh, transforming finance? Yeah. And figuring it out. Right. So, you know, you had this clear aha moment that this is your passion and your purpose to transform the financial conversation from fear and greed to love and joy and so then what and it sounds like you had to be creative so well, how are you I would creative? Take a particular type of uh of network for finance because there's all kinds of finance you have to go after so mm -hmm. i would take a particular uh you know description and i would uh just start uh, calling around and uh one thing i did <laughs> i uh i pretended i was a search firm 
and I would call and say uh, we were trying to, uh, well, one, one particular thing that was really outstanding, uh, the, the um, typical finance industry had, uh, had when, when the, the um, oh, what's the, the um, <laughs> one of the main networks I've done, I'm 80, solar and sometimes power. I forget. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The solar, solar industry. Solar that industry. Was, yeah. So I, uh, I uh, targeted the solar industry that it, ha it had been stopped in its tracks by the finance industry, which didn't want that business taken away. And so I uh, found, I started looking for some people that believed that their life destiny path was to uh, make solar happen for the world. And I had uh, 30 different sectors that I had to have represented so that together they could stand up against the finance industry. And it took me uh, nine months. And I found someone to finance me who believed that his purpose was that we had to do that. And I called around for nine months. I found people in every sector, the 30 sectors that were necessary. And I would just call them and say, um, I am Susan Davis, and uh, uh, I'm working with people that want to start uh, an industry to make solar happen for the world. And I've heard that you had some interest in that and blah, blah, blah. And I had 30 sectors I had to do the research in uh, to have it be robust enough that it could work. And mm -hmm. I found them. It took me nine months. And uh, I found a friend who uh, had had a spiritual experience that told him he was supposed to help make solar happen for the world. So he funded me. And so no one had to pay any money when I found them. They were so thrilled to get together and be introduced to each other. And they, uh, the very first meeting, they all decided to go forward. They decided how they do it, who would do what. And then they um, decided that they couldn't, they wouldn't start a group because the, uh, the other, the industry would try and put them out of business. So they did it in secret. They didn't have any organization. They didn't have any publicity. They all paid their way to the meetings. They practically intermarried. They got so close to each other because they all needed each other. You had 30 different sectors that had to be covered and they had the people to cover them and they could all do it for free and with joy and creativity, right? Um, so it was really quite amazing. That, that's probably the best network I ever did because it was the hardest. It was the most expensive. It was the most dangerous. And you know it was a really big deal to go up against the uh, the industry. Yeah. So that was probably my best uh, success. But I loved every minute of it, and they love each other. They practically intermarried. I mean, you couldn't separate them. They would never miss a meeting. It was like God, I'm helping to save Earth. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's really uh, cool. And it's um and it's a good example of how. Because in farming and gardening and life, we all, it's, a, it's about creativity. It's about listening to your inner wisdom. It's about listening to that divine guidance and having the next conversation and noticing what's opening up right in front of you and on the horizon to take those next steps. The, it was, Susan, we, Susan and I, we did have some, some gaps, you know, she, she came out of finance yeah and i was coming out of agriculture and um, the one time we were driving home from w w milwaukee in the snow and uh i was going through some years of drought and i was losing money and susan said well why don't you do a, a, a budget with showing a drought and i said well what would be the point of that it would show i was going to lose money and then i'd have to sell the farm and she said yeah, well, and then I had to say to her, well, you know, I'm into agriculture, not agribusness. <laughs> and I didn't say a word. That shut yeah, me up. She didn't know how to answer that one. <laughs> I was like. Yeah. It, it's so totally different, you know. Yeah. Uh, but that's why I uh, kind of put him on a pedestal. Yeah. That's the guy he was. You can. Yeah. So no, tell but, me. How did you find your way out of that drought? Because I think that's a conversation that we often miss uh, in the the farming conversation and in the community is is those hard times, especially right now, because there's a lot of even though even though we're losing farmers um, super super fast for a lot of different reasons, um, there's also this romantic notion around farming, and so there's a lot of 
young people and middle-aged people and just new farmers coming into farming thinking, you know, I'm going to farm, I'm going to grow food. I'm, it's going to be like this, this and that. But there's a lot of, or I should say, and there's a lot of, like you said, droughts. And so how did you find your way through that drought and what got you to the other side? Um, out of five years, we had three years of drought and it was very stressful financially and my back was going out. You know, just the two of us milking 120 cows and farming about 500 acres doing, doing the usual, you know, 60, 80 hour a week. And um, right about then uh, we were invited to have a, we were looking for a place to have a vacation you know, mm -hmm. like in, in Central America or something in one February and could never find a place. And then Susan helped a woman with some, uh, gave us some suggestions how she could uh, continue her work. She did it pro bono. And the woman said, well, I just bought a house, mm -hmm. a little farm in Bilcabamba, Ecuador. You could, in exchange, you could go and have a vacation there. Mm -hmm. And so we took it up and we did come for a vacation. We liked it so much. We we ended up buying a house and uh, we went back you know, to the States and my back was going out and I decided, I, was, I got to thinking, gosh, I could be in Ecuador. It would cost me less because I wouldn't be losing money <laughs> and not having to work 60, 80 hours a week. And uh, so I did sell the cows and uh, we, we sold the farm and we did move down here. But in answer to your question, I think, you just about, if you want to succeed, to create a community around yourself, you know, in, in farming, to do it on your own is really, really tough. I mean, I saw a lot of, you know, I did I'll be hang right in. Back. I have to take a break here. I did, I saw a lot of uh, young families, you know, break up and stuff under the pressure mm -hmm. uh, to, to stay farming on your own for you know, 30, 40 years is really tough. Um, yeah. Some people have the right temperament for it, but often the wife will say, hey, it's enough, I'm out of here. And the <laughs> guy mm -hmm. flogging it out, or whatever. Um, uh, yeah, but, I love, go ahead. Yeah, anyway, I think, you know, have a supportive community would be important in, in my mind, yeah. Yeah, it sounded like you said two two things there. One is have a supportive community, and the other was notice what's opening up for you, right? Yeah, like mm -hmm. because, and I think that's where we can get really stuck a lot of the times because we want something to be a certain way. We have expectations around it. We have attachment to it, and um, and we take a lot of agency sometimes in what we're trying to create is, and and what we think we're meant to create, and um, sometimes that can be um paralyzing especially when it doesn't work out and it's not necessarily um a bad thing all the time it's just a matter of doing things differently and like you said maybe it's building community maybe it's changing direction it can be yeah for me you know i i my self-worth was so tied up in being successful farmer you know <laughs> if i i, yeah. I a joke that if as a 19 year old, if I had known what I know now, life could have been so much easier. <laughs> but we, we have to learn whatever we have to learn. I always thought if I was bigger and better, you know, I'd have more respect and blah, blah, blah. They got tied up in the whole materialistic thing that our ages. I think we, you know, if we're going to survive on this earth, we, we have to move through the whole materialistic thing that that we're so stuck in because the earth just can't support what we need what we think we need yeah so, what did you learn that you would tell your 19 year old self oh well i i, I had an interesting experience you know we on our land here it's it's about uh, 10 acres and and uh, my whole life, 
you know, I did the spiritual stuff with the biodynamics and everything, but I still got sucked into the bigger is better. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then one day I was walking around the farm here and I realized on this farm, finally, after 50 years, I had created here what first inspired me as a 19 year old. And I had come full circle. It was, um, wasn't a shock. It was like, wow, you know, I've been, you know, the Holy Grail story, you know, Parsifal finds the grail, the, the, the castle, and then he goes away and he spends the rest of his life looking for it. And I yeah. think we, uh, most of us, uh, uh, if we look back, you know, with a little age, we can see that, that that's been our life looking for the, for the grail that's appropriate for, for our path. And Susan and I, when we were building this house here, we lived in a little adobe cabin just with a screen. Mm-hmm. And the room was big enough for our bed and, and, a, and a desk. And we had just a little bit of solar power. We did have internet, but we didn't have a refrigerator and stuff. And it was we lived like that for a year and a half. And it made me realize that, gosh, we really don't need all those things. And we were just as happy in that little adobe cabin as we are in this big house. Mm. Um, and I think a lot of us would realize we don't, you know, if it came down to it, all our possessions, it's not what gives us happiness. Yeah. 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 It's so true. The earth just can't support it. You know, I was so happy when I could renew my lease for my Dodge pickup truck every three years. (laughs) Advertising convinced me that the new truck was better, but you know, it's not really, yeah. So, yeah. Um, and what is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you'd like to share, you'd like to uh, present? Um, yeah, just to, um, you know, somebody might see this, see this or read this. Who, who could be attracted to what we're doing. So we're open to having more, more people join us here, you know, stewarding this beautiful piece of land and creating community. Um, so that's a, a dream right now so that we become more elders, not have to carry it. Be great if there was a, you know, a group of younger people or whatever. Yeah. Or some retired people too. Yeah. You're looking to build your community there, there right now, literally as well. Yeah, because it's too too much for Susan and I to carry it. Yeah. Uh, financially, emotionally, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you'll find. I know you'll find your perfect people to come and play with you there, work with you, live yeah. with you. Um, is Susan coming back? So I can say thank you to her, or is she? Um, did she need to leave? I think. Yeah, we should just keep going. She'll come back if she can. Okay. 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 That's cool. Um, I think she's coming back. I can look. Yeah, here she comes. We're just getting ready to wrap up soon. Yep. Sorry, but no, that's okay. That's okay. Um, What have we not covered today that's on your heart that you would really like to share with I couldn't hear you I said what's on your heart that we have not spoke to today that you'd like to share with farmers or gardeners or anybody who's listening in well when you asked about intuition you know Mm -hmm. I was um and I I talked about you know being mainly a a path of the will I always did find time to do some meditation. Mm. So I think that's really important to um, make the time for it. And part of that is just creating rhythm, you know, finding a time, even if it's 10 or 20 minutes to, mm. to keep centered. If you don't keep, keep that spiritual center, everything will fall away. And, and I think, yeah, that, that's so important. And the same for, um, you know, being in a relationship to to make sure that spiritual center is is there. 
to work on that. Boy, is that true? Walter's really incredible about that. And uh, my answer to your question is, uh, I personally believe deeply that um, before we're born, we choose what our life purpose is supposed to be. And then when we get born, they wipe our mind and we start from nothing like, I don't know. And um, so I spent my whole life, why am I here? And it's to transform uh, finance from greed and fear to love and joy. And it took me till 30 to figure out that's why I was here. And I was a mess before then, because I just had to know <clears throat> once I did, I was a clean shot. I was happy all the time. No matter what happened, I handled it. It was okay because I knew why I was here. And I had so much joy by creating the social investment industry. Um, I, was one, I was one of the founders and brought in a lot of people with me and we've all been joyful and successful and it's just been incredible. And I was gifted with the best husband in the world because I was on my life path, right? <laughs> So as far as I'm concerned, that's all you need to do is just find out why you're here, do it with joy and, and love, and uh, enjoy the health of it, and the, the, everything about it is the most creative uh, challenge you can have in your life. So that's me. I'm happy. I have no complaints. Yeah, Susan, how, for a person who still hasn't figured out why they're here, how, how do they do that? I'm sorry, what, what? I didn't for, a person, for a person who hasn't figured out why they're here yet, and they're still on that path, what are questions they can ask themselves? What are things they can do? How can they awaken to that? It's really listening to yourself. What makes you happy? What makes you sad? What are you drawn to? What are you not drawn to? Uh, your body is going to tell you the answer all the time. You go into a situation, a big room of people, and they're supposed to some event or whatever. What does that room tell you? But what does your heart do? What does your soul do? What does your body do? Trust your body. Your body never lies. Your yeah. body never lies. Trust your body. Do what it tells you. And I'm 80. I'm the happiest married woman I've ever heard of. <laughs> and I can be the proof of why you should do what I'm telling you. <laughs> Susan has ability to um, find the right people. We'll, we'll go into a room, say, with 20 or 30 people or more. And I'm like, oh, how am I going to, you know, what am I going to do the next two hours? And I, Susan disappears and I find her, and, you know, five minutes later in deep conversation with somebody. And then she, you know, she can, she has that ability. She was also um, recently given an award for the godmother of social investing. So she wow. goes back 40, 50 years. Yeah. Mm, celebrating and honoring that. Yeah. But I was just making myself happy. <laughs> yeah. And I can see that. And I think there's so much that we can learn from that, right? There's so much that we can learn from that. And from this whole conversation with both of you from um, just trusting, trusting that inner wisdom, trusting the intuition, trusting those, those next steps, trusting the people that come into your life or the people that are going to bring you to your next step that they're there for a reason so to speak yeah there's a lot to learn from this conversation and how um your lives really mirrored e mirrored each other in really profound ways and i think that a lot of the times people feel there's a huge disconnect from our food right there's a huge disconnect from where it comes from how it's grown um what it does for our body, what's healthy, what's not healthy. And the way that you've both lived your lives is all about connection. And I think that the more that we can deepen into who we are, why we're here, what our purpose is, the more we deepen into the way we show up for ourselves, the way we show up for others, the way we connect to earth, the way we connect to nature, the way we connect to I have a gift for your, your listeners because yeah. uh, I wanted to share this method of innovation that is free to everyone. It's never been for sale. Uh, the book is called The Trojan Horse of Love by Susan Davis uh, before I was married to Walter. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's free and it's a wonderful, uh, it tells the real story of what I had to go through and what worked and why uh, trusting your intuition is 
the only thing you need to live happily, trust your intuition. So it's a Trojan horse of love and it tells all the good and the bad and the, and everything else about uh, my, my story. Yeah. It's, story yeah. Book. It's, a, it's a lovely book. And did you say Walter has a book too? Uh, Walter has his own book, but his is for sale, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was going to mention that uh, it's a, a farmer's love, right? It's a beautiful book as yes. well. It's yeah. a wonderful tell, book. Us, tell us about your book. Well, when we came down to Ecuador, you know, 15 years ago, yeah. I thought it would be good to just write down the major, like, spiritual turning points in my life and uh, state them in a, in a positive way, you know, because, like, I've lost, lost a farm, you know, and you could be so angry, you know, the bankers did this or, you know, we had three years of drought and blah, blah, blah. But really, to to see how how it was a, a turning point in my life, you know what what was the gift of that? And I really wrote it for myself, and mm -hmm. I showed it to my kids and friends, and everybody said, "Oh, that's they really enjoyed it." Mm -hmm. And then I showed it to a friend at the Anthroposophical Press, and they they said they would publish it. So I was fabulous. surprised. I didn't write it to you know to publish, but. It was more my yeah. journey. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I did see that. It's on your website, and then um, can is it where where can they find your book, Walter? Where can people find your book? Oh, it's through Amazon. Through Amazon. Okay, yeah. that's great. That's what I thought. So people can find yeah. your book through Amazon. And how about you, Susan? Where can people find your book? Uh, just uh, put it into any any thing. Google a Trojan. Google. Google. Uh, the tr Google the Trojan Horse of Love, of love and, and, and uh, it's all free. Just down or, or they can go to um, <coughs> kinshipearth.org mm -hmm. and they can see um, all about Susan's work. And for us, it's finca sagradacom And I'll, I'll send you a link to a, a six minute video that was just completed. A, a, yeah week ago shows all about what we've done on the farm fabulous think is f-i-n-c-a means farm think of sagrada s-a-g-r-a-d-a -A -A, uh, sacred land farm think of sagrada that's oh, the I love it. I love it. well you're having a wonderful life i want to compliment you for following your intuition because obviously you've been doing that real well and uh anytime you want to be in touch with us just uh let us know or come down and visit. It's an, an incredible sacred, sacred farm. It's an incredible sacred farm. It was a, just a mess, a destroyed place uh, a few years ago before we took it over. And we are looking for a biodynamic farmer who also likes to teach and live in community. <laughs> oh, man, I can't wait for you to find. I want to be that person, but I know I'm not that person for you right now. <laughs> Part of me. I will. I will. I'd love to. Yeah, I really would love to. And I can't wait for you to find that farmer. I want to say thank you so much for the time today. So You're thank welcome. you. Our pleasure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my pleasure too. Grateful you joined us for that conversation and interview. If you haven't subscribed to Heart and Soil Magazine yet, head over to heartandsoilmagazine.com. Click on that subscribe button and join us. You make yourself an amazing day and I'm really grateful you're part of our community.